Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to this um, lecture by Professor Sidney Burris from um, Rice University. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome him on campus. We have actually met him at Rice University twice, so it's, uh, it's great that he has found the time to visit our campus and also spend a few days here, and we are making sure that we make full use of his time. <laughs> um, so we are we have several activities that he has already undertaken and several more that we have planned for him. Um, this is um, actually part of hopefully what will be an annual lecture series in memory of Professor S. Sampath. And um, I should thank uh, our alumnus uh, Pradeep Malik from um, Malik Pucha from uh, Houston from the original or uh, the first batch of 1964. Um, Malik has been truly um, a dynamo in, uh, in, in getting this organized, working both sides of the equation, both in Madras and in, um, in Houston to put this program together. Um, the um, Professor M.S. Sampat, Professor Sampat lecture series is um, uh, something that we would like to see on an ongoing basis. We are also trying to set up a chair professorship in the name of um, Professor Sampat. And um, hopefully, many of our alumni will step in and contribute generously to the, to the chair to make it happen very quickly. And here again, Malik is um, putting in tremendous efforts to, to make that happen. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this lecture. Um, what we will do is uh, a few of uh, our alumni uh, want to say a few words about the, um, the, the lecture series and Professor Sampath. So I will invite them on stage to do so first. And then I will invite one of our um, Rice alumni, Professor Sri Krishna Basham, to give the introduction to Professor Sidney Burris. And after that, Professor Sidney Burris will be delivering his lecture. So shall I, Malik, you want to come on stage first? Professor Nagarajan, Sidney Burris, Natarajan, our first registrar Natarajan, professors and then faculty of the IIT Madras, and Professor. Okay. okay. Maybe let me start again then. Professor Nagarajan, <laughs> Sidney Burris, members of the IIT Madras faculty, Professor Natarajan and Professor Sampas family, classmates and fellow IITians. Happy 89th birthday, Professor Sampath. It's a great honor to address this group at Professor Sampath's distinguished lecture to be given by Sidney Burris. Professor of EE, Electrical Engineering, former dean, and most importantly, a fellow Stanford alumni of Professor Sampath. <laughs> My name is PMB Subramanyam, 1.084 from the first batch. That's how the numbering used to be. And now I'm Malek Pucha. I'm a retired senior systems engineer and project management specialist. And uh, after working for about 35 years at Johnson Space Center, NASA contractor community. An incident that I think I just wanted to give you, since it is a, a, a small group, uh, I just want to give a, an incident where I got Sampath mad. And uh, as some of you know, when uh, we, because we were the first batch after the uh, 62 war, they decided to have uh, our first two batches uh, go through quickly. And so we graduate, we finished our exams in 64 February. And then when we came back as a uh, joint for the MTech program, then when we came back to uh, the, uh, for the hostels, uh, allocation, all the rooms in Kaveri and Krishna hostel were already taken. 
and so those are designated as the postgraduate or the graduate students one. So we did not uh, we did not get an allocation, and we were uh, temporarily allocated at Gemini Hostel at that time. And then Ganga was getting ready, and it was not ready then. And one evening. Uh, myself, Sudhir Chandra, and one of our, a few of our classmates, P.K. Prabhakaran, and Blue, and other people, we were all coming back from the, uh, I think maybe in the evening after the lunch or, or dinner or whatever. Then I happened to see Professor Sampath uh, on the way, and at that time, Professor Sampath was also the chairman of the Council of Wardens. And so he was aware that we were trying to go to the new hostel so that we were all graduate students, so we need to have our own separate one from the undergraduate ones. Then when I encountered Professor Sampath, then I just casually said, Professor Sampath, what happened? Then he got mad and said, what can happen? And then, then of course, he gave an explanation and then said, okay, hey, you know, that need to be cleaned, the rooms need to be cleaned and all that one. But anyway, so. That's how, so I think I, I had the opportunity to make him mad, so that's anyway. So I think I wanted to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about the purpose and the plans that we had at the uh, endowment chair. Essentially, all of us in this room have a professor who had made a profound impact on us, both during the stay in our, uh, on campus, as well as subsequently later on in professional life. And I think that's what we wanted to do, that's the purpose. And essentially honor the professors from 59 onward from the time that it, uh, the, IB, um, the, other, the IIT Madras started. So we wanted to institute the one in the name of Professor Sampath, he was the first director and professor of electrical engineering light current for his significant contributions to educators and his uh, educate the students to develop the electrical engineering department in general and to grow the institute at large. Next one. And then we had the, because we went through the, all the approval process, and on the alumni day on uh, July 23rd, 2011, uh, Dr. Anand was able to announce it, and so I think that's what the date was, and then I don't want to go through the YouTube one. And then of course our funding, the funding raise, I mean the fundraising goal is to 100 to 100K, I mean 150K, from both from the individual as well as from the corporate to, to initiate you by July 31st. And then I want to go to the, the, the quick one on, the, uh, on that hot link. Okay, this is the, uh, the website. Just keep going a little bit. And we do have the quickly the purpose and all of that, and then the benefits of the endowment is what I wanted to spend a little bit. If you look at the, this, uh, this uh, Excel spreadsheet, IIT Madras, we have about, you know, we started in 59, but we had, uh, oh, okay, I can do it over here, not there. So we started in 59, but I think current faculty is about 550, and then we have only five distinguished endowment chairs, and so it's about 0.01. Stanford started in 1891. It has got 2043 faculty. They have 547. That's 0.27. Rice, 670. We have 154.23. And it started in 1912. MIT, as most of you know, that IITs were started based upon the MIT model. And out of the 1050, we have 505 distinguished chairs. So that's essentially 0.48. And 18, so of course, it started in 1865. The, the very purpose of the endowment chairs is to attract the high-powered people to teach or to do the research at IIT Madras. And so I think that's where we were, I'm really along with the faculty and the director and everybody else. This is one, one way of endowment chairs helping the institute to raise the level to be the world-class level. That's the one of the reasons why we're trying to do that. And yeah, go ahead. 
And I think we do have, so I think I got some of the approbations, including from uh, Pre President Abdul Kalam, and then I think uh, Bhaskar Ramurthy, and then previous directors, uh, Anant and Dr. Indresan, and then from IIT Kanpur, and then uh, from two of them, and the DRDO. So essentially, I covered most of the people, most of the organization that Professor Sampath was associated with. Professor Sampat, you were students of 1964, the most eligible bachelors in the country. That's how he addressed us about 110 of us in the high voltage high bay on July 10th, 1964, are the most benevolent grandparents in the world now. Finally, on behalf of the eight of the first batch of BTEC electrical engineering light current students, we want to thank you for being there for us when we needed most. And because of your guidance, we became the competent professionals in the global enterprises. And more importantly, because of our association with you, we became better human beings. Thank you, Professor Sampath. Chuda Manimami, thank you for taking care of Professor Sampat so that he can mold and craft us to be the students of life. Lots of people asked me why I was doing this for the last three years plus. Simple reason. He was a good man. And I was profoundly molded by him. We should honor him. A final tribute. His life was gentle and the element so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. Thank you all for your time. The people are from the first batch, Chimanlal Chowda, S. Gauranadan, Pradeep Gupta, Prasad Vepa, P.M. Venkat Subramanyam, that's me, that's how the, my IIT name was, and Srinivas Nageswar right there, and then G.N. Sarma. Thank you. And now I would like uh, Professor Natarajan to say a few words, and then uh, Srinivas Nageshwar will say a few words also. Thank you. Emeritus Professor, Sidney Burris, Professor Nagarajan, Mr. Malik Pucha, co-founders of the IIT Madras and the benevolent guardians of the Institute. It is such a pleasure and a privilege to be with you all. But I must confess to the fact that I was given three minutes to five minutes to speak about Professor Sampath. It will take a few hours to talk about a multi-splendored man like Professor Sampath. Of course, I know that a model talk should have only brevity, probity, a little levity to spice it up, but never longevity. I am aware of that. But still, Professor Sampat came to my ken as the brother of S. Krishna Swami, IAS. He was a colleague of mine. And when he was in the Indian Institute of Science, we invited him to come over and join us, Professor of Electrical Engineering here. He joined up, and then after two years, by sheer dint of his merit, he was promoted as the Deputy Director of the IIT and Chairman of the Council of Wardens. As has been brilliantly put by poet Bailey, we live in deeds and not in years, in thought, not in breath, in feelings, not figures on a dial. We should count life by heart throbs. He most lives who thinks the most, feels the noblest, and acts the best. That sums up Professor Sampath. He was a man who lived with nobility 
and probity in his life. And when death came, he faced it with courage and dignity. You have all heard of the famous remark of Woody Allen, the American Hollywood producer, he said, I am not afraid of death. It is just is I don't want to be there when it comes. Not Professor Sabbath. In fact, he was like uh, King George the Sixth, of whom Sir Winston Churchill said, when death came to him, he came to him as a long lost friend. He was not afraid of death. He was great because of his probity and nobility all through his life. He was a very humble person. And one has to remember the famous words of, of, of Dr. Albert Einstein when he addressed the Yale University Convocation. He said, my advice to all the graduates is, be not only men of success, but men of value. And he proceeded to explain what he meant. He said, a man of success is one who takes more out of life than what he puts into it, whereas a man of value is who puts more into life than what he takes out of it. So, similarly with Professor Sabbath, he would never, uh, he was not a torturer, a teacher in the ordinary sense. He was like Dean Inge who said, you must put value into your education. Education is not knowledge of facts, but knowledge of values. That was Professor Sampad. He was a true teacher. The Taitreya Upanishad defines a great teacher as a teacher of truth, who preaches and practices what he teaches. And Professor Sampad was of that type. I have always enjoyed being with him. As Deputy Director of the IIT, Professor of Electrical Engineering, and then Director of Kanpur, and his final post-graduation, the Vice Chancellor of the Sri Satyasa University. Uh, so I feel greatly honored to speak a few words about Professor Sampat. When Buddha returned after his enlightenment to Kapilavastu, and met his weeping father, King Suddhodana. He said, I, you belong to the lineage of kings. I belong to the lineage of the Buddhas. Such an enlightened man like him was Professor Sampat. Thank you. Mr. R. Natarayan, sir, you are always a hard act to follow. <laughs> it was like that when we were at the institute, and if anything, your oratorical skills improve with age. <laughs> Professor, Mr. Natarajan, Professor Burris, Professor Nagarajan, my colleagues from the first batch who are here, and everybody else, uh, it's a great honor to have this uh, privilege of uh, talking about a gentleman who really made something out of us. You know, he was really our first coach and mentor. And, uh, you know, at that time, we were, what, 17, 18, 19. He had a massive impact on us because he was really the person we were, we were kind of looking up to. You know, at that time, if, uh, as we looked at all the branches of engineering, electronics was a little bit of an outlier because all the other branches, electrical, mechanical, civil, and so on, were kind of mainstream branches, and electronics was somewhere, you know, something that people didn't understand. And I remember when I told somebody that I was studying electronics, I said, oh, so you'll finally be able to repair some radios. That's, that's all that peop people thought of. And everybody said, you're going to have difficulty finding a job and whatever. And, you know, in that kind of a scenario, you think about somebody like Professor Sampat, who many years before that, not only had studied, but dedicated himself to a life of teaching people in this area. Uh, you really have to say he probably hats off and he had some real guts to be able to do that because uh, he was really at the forefront of, uh, of, of all of this. And you know, they were all very, very, at that time, he, along with the staff that he put together, 
were extremely concerned about us and we were the first products and it was kind of I understand now running companies that when you ship the first product you always do it with your heart in your mouth and we were the first graduates that were being shipped out and I know that uh, from Professor Sampathan down everybody sent us out with some fear and trepidation I think. I remember one of the faculty said my God, Nageshwar, we'd love to keep you here for another two years and send you fellows out with a B.Tech. Because, you know, at that time, because when we started out in the first batch, uh, the campus was not ready. We actually moved here in the third year. A lot of the machines and equipment were not here. In fact, what happened, and PMV and some of my colleagues here will remember that, uh, for example, some of the electrical machines came very late. We didn't have machines to be able to do any lab work. So some of the technicians went and bought some surplus machines from the army, kind of rejiggered them, got them up, and they were able to basically teach a, run an electrical machines lab. So that was the kind of thing that was done, and there was very much a startup mentality that, that happened here among all the people. And of course, Professor Zamput was at the forefront of, uh, uh, of all of that. I remember, you know, at that time, some of the mechanical equipment in the workshops came late. There were no lates, so we had to spend our summer vacation with all the sweat and all that, and these tools were flying out of the lates, and we were still working in all these workshops, and we had to go through all that. And those were all times that really bonded everybody together. And uh, I must say that uh, those, are, those, those are the ties that we even feel very strongly about, and those are the kinds of things that tie us back to uh, somebody like, like Professor Sampath. You know, it's exactly 50 years this year. Uh, like PM, we mentioned, we passed out in February. We had our first convocation, convocation in, in, in July. And you know, for all the trepidation and everything that the professors had, and Professor Sampad also had, I think we proved him well, and we did well by him. Uh, of the eight of us who graduated, uh, you know, Pretty, uh, uh, one of them was the only one who didn't get involved in, in, in engineering. He uh, went to the Indian Air Force. But seven of us uh, were, were, became engineers and practiced engineering. And uh, of course, at that time, all of us went abroad. All seven of us ended up going out of, uh, going out of India. But then the ties to India became much stronger, and all of us are doing things back here. And of, this, of the rest of the seven, one of them ended up with the World Bank and did very well after doing his MBA. And uh, all of us ended up in engineering kinds of things and became technocrats and, and, and uh, kind of did pretty well. And uh, it seems to me that we really owe Professor Sampath a great deal of thanks for having mentored us and coached us and instilled in us the interest in engineering. And of course, from people thinking about us repairing radios to what it is today, where frankly electronics and computer science are way up there in terms of things that people want to do, has been a long journey. And of course, one of the big things that we learned from him is the fact that you don't stop learning. And that is something that has helped us over the years because frankly, everything that we learned at that time was obsolete a few years later and so we had to constantly keep learning. So one of the things I tell people that what we got from him was the ability to learn how to learn. And because this is a, 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 constant, uh, a, a constant learning process. So I, I must congratulate my uh, colleague, PMV Subramaniam. He has put a huge amount of time and, uh, in terms of bringing this up. And we obviously stand behind him. And uh, we are going to support him to the hilt to, uh, to, to make sure that this endowment chair happens. And I was talking a little bit earlier with him that we'd love to have a voice in who kind of also fills the chair all the time because we really want to have absolutely top-notch people doing this. And with all of us abroad and so on, we, I think, have enough influence and contacts and so on to make sure that really top-notch people come here. We don't want the thing devalued. And we want to make sure that it is done really well. And, the end, and people who occupy the endowment chair are worthy of Professor Sampath. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Sidney Burras, especially as a Rice alumni and as a student in his digital signal processing class in 1996, a course that I enjoyed thoroughly. Professor Burras uh, 
received his PhD degree from Stanford in 1965 and since then he has been at Rice and where he is currently Max Field and Oshman Professor Emer Emeritus at ECE and Senior Strategist for the Connections uh, Project. Uh, from 1998 to 2005 he was Dean of Engineering and uh, he has received several teaching awards at Rice, I think five or six times and he's co-authored five books. His research interests are in digital signal processing and specifically uh, digital filter design, uh, algorithms for f computing the fast Fourier transform and wavelets. And his work in these areas is well recognized. And if you have ever used uh, commercial software to compute any of these, you probably used uh, some of the algorithms. And he is a life fellow of the IEEE and received the highest honor in signal processing which is the uh, IEEE Jack S. Kilby Signal Processing Medal in 2009. He also received the Distinguished Service Award from Rice Engineering Alumni in 2013 for serving Rice from 1965. And in addition to his DSP work, uh, he is also always interested in teaching and using technology in teaching. And the Connections Project actually started in 1999 when I was a, I was a student at Rice. And he's been a part of that ever since, and he's now senior strategist for that uh, project. So with that, I welcome Professor Sidney Burras. It's a great honor to be here for this particular occasion. Uh, the group of people on the front row here uh, delight me very much. This is what the younger students can look forward to a satisfying and happy career and to be able to be together with their classmates and enjoy looking back over their, their lifetime. Uh, apparently, uh, the professor that they're honoring had a powerful impact on their lives and I think each of you have professors that have had a powerful impact on your life. What I would like to do to honor this occasion is talk a little bit about higher education. I have devoted my own life to that. I have been a professor. I uh, had only one job in my entire life, and that is a professor at Rice University. So I ended up retiring from the first job I ever took. That's not a very courageous thing to do, but it turned out to be what uh, was satisfying to me. What, uh, what I see as higher education's role is to pass on basically the products of civilization from one generation to the next. We try very hard uh, to do that, to learn things, to create knowledge and pass them on to the next generation. They will add to that and pass them on to still the next generation. That has remained the uh, role of higher education for literally hundreds of years. I think we're in the process now of change. Change is something that's quite uh, unusual in the university. It's one of the most stable institutions on earth. The university looks pretty much the same year after year after year. I think we're in the process now of finally changing and the change is due to technology. Technology is what we engineers uh, do, and it turns out that education is pretty much a product of technology. These microphones, this uh, PowerPoint, uh, the, the building, uh, virtually everything around us is a, some form of technology or another. And some of them have become uh, extraordinarily sophisticated. I want to uh, show now how that can be applied to education itself. Now, you've probably heard the term a perfect storm. A perfect storm is the result of several factors coming together. A high tide, a strong wind, perhaps an earthquake, a number of factors come together and cause a catastrophe of uh, unparalleled uh, consequence. Well, this is not a catastrophe, but it is a result of several factors, each adding to the other. 
the textbook has been the primary technology of education for decades, for actually for centuries. That's in the process of change. A new open textbook is emerging. A new open course, the MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, MOOC. That's something that didn't exist a few years ago. It's now changing the face of higher education. A personalized learning environment. If you stop and think for a moment, it's remarkable that we're able to educate people at all. We don't know how the human brain learns, and yet we try to teach. So we're doing something that we don't understand the very mechanism that's behind it, and yet we actually do a fairly decent job. We're beginning to learn how the human brain learns, and I think we'll see a significant improvement in the efficiency and the effectiveness of education as a result. And then finally, there's some work done on certification. Diplomas, degrees, credit, all of that. Personally, I'm less interested in certification and I'm more interested in the educational side of things, but certification is an important feature. So where is this coming from? Part of it in the United States, but I think part of it worldwide, is coming from an incredible increase in the cost of education. Whether it's a public education and therefore a high tax, uh, high taxes are required to support it, or private uh, universities such as mine, where alumni support the university directly, but it's incredibly expensive. My, uh, my children and grandchildren have gone to uh, college and it will cost close to f between forty and fifty thousand dollars a year for one year of college. I have two kids. That's a lot of money. It's about one car per year per kid. And the only question is, you know, what college means, what size of car I'm talking about. But it's a lot of money. The second is uh, an increase in access. That's not a problem to this group I'm talking to now. We're all incredibly lucky and we have access to excellent education. Most of the world does not. That's about to change. And then finally, the role of education in a, in a national community. That a country cannot have a vital economy without a trained workforce. That just simply cannot happen in today's world. And a democracy cannot function properly without an educated populace. So for a society to function, education is absolutely crucial. And that seems to be agreed upon by virtually everyone on the earth. Very, very few people advocate no education. A few, perhaps. Now this... Uh, this next idea I want to present to you as something worth applying to any technological change. And that is when there's a, a truly disruptive change, it occurs in two phases. The first phase is the new technology does what the old technology did, only better. When the printing press came into popular use, the books that were produced didn't look much different from the hand copied books. So they just did the old job better, more accurately, less expensive, uh, more accessible. They did a better job. But very shortly after that, mass produced books changed society. And the book changed the world, a true revolution. So what we're seeing now is the first stages of technology simply improving on the, techno on the educational systems that we've had in the past. The MOOC, is that new? No, not really. We're just taking a lecture, we're taking what's going on now, putting a video camera, and transmitting it at a distance. But basically, it's the same thing going on. 
So uh, we're still in phase one with most of the changes in education that we see taking place. So if we look at the book, which was the solution to the, what, 19th and 20th century problem, in the 21st century, it's actually a problem. It's the barrier. It's what's keeping us from achieving our goals rather than being a source of uh, achieving our goals. Take a look at the price of textbooks in the US. If we start back at, uh, what, a little around, around 1976 or 78, and we look at the cost of educational books, they've increased 800%, far outstripping the increase in medical services, and they are much too high, or the cost of houses, or the general inflationary cost of just the consumer price index. So textbooks have grown faster than almost anything else in our society. The bedrock of our, of our future is becoming completely inaccessible. From a different source, when we look at the top uh, blue curve here, educational books and supplies, the, uh, the, the red curve is basically all other uh, items, and then the bottom green curve is clothing or apparel. Once again, we see the textbooks grow much faster than everything else. Well, which textbooks? Well, uh, business school textbooks are the most expensive of all. And next to that, natural science, and so on and so forth, with library books being the cheapest. Another set of costs, economics is the most expensive, engineering is the second most experience, uh, expensive, So a means of trying to solve the problem of the increasing cost of books is to copy what the computer scientists have done with software, what's called the open source movement in software. So we're looking at an open educational movement to produce educational resources. It's open in the sense that it's available for any student, teacher, or author. So open comes in a variety of forms, but it's not just open to the student. Like, for example, Wikipedia is open to a student or to a teacher, and it's pretty much open to any author, but you have to be subject to the uh, editor, editing of other people. Uh, the, the MIT's open courseware is open for the student and to the teacher, but not to the author. If one of you wants to put a, something in uh, OCW, you can't. But your students can use it. A new licensing system under Creative Commons, which will maximize the uh, ease of use, so that if you have a Creative Commons copyright on your work, other people can use it very efficiently and very effectively. Modular, the material is all in small modules which can then be assembled and put together in a variety of ways. And finally, it's implemented in a semantic language, which makes it easy to find with a search engine. And the semantic language is either XML, which will mean something to some of you, or uh, HTML5, which is the latest version of what you see when you look at a web browser. So we have uh, started a project at Rice, and now it uh, extends over a number of universities, called Connections. It was founded in 1999 by Richard Baranuk, a, uh, at that time, associate professor of electrical engineering, who wanted to apply the tools that electrical engineers use on other things to the process of education. In other words, the internet and the computer and information theory. So currently we have about uh, 1,400 books or collections of modules, about 22,000 modules. 
We have examples of material in 40 different languages uh, used in 190 countries, uh, over a million users per month, and uh, for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics usage, over 100 million times used in, since uh, 2007. Now this is an example of some professors put, getting together to uh, write a textbook in signal processing, my own research area. And we have four American universities represented there, uh, Georgia Tech, Ohio State, Wisconsin, and Michigan. These professors are all saying, okay, you write this module, and I'll write this module, and you write that module, and we'll modify somebody else's module. And the, course, the, uh, the list of universities there on the right, over here, are an example of a few that are using this material and contributing to it. Notice that uh, you might be surprised to see that Vietnam is a heavy user of this uh, technology. Macedonia, that uses Cyrillic alphabet, is a heavy user of, of connections, as is Cambridge in, uh, in England and a variety of other, of other places. Now, some of, some of the uses were a bit of a surprise. Kitty Jones has published her music theory material in Connections. It's the most popular material in the entire collection, music theory. I gave a lecture on this in, uh, in Vilnius, Lithuania. And after my lecture, a short Asian man came up and said, Dr. Boris, thank you so much for your uh, Kitty Jones's music. I teach music from her material. I looked at his name tag and he was from uh, Mongolia. Kitty Jones lives in Illinois. So there I was in Lithuania talking to a Mongolian about material written in Illinois on a system in Houston, Texas. And I thought, okay, the world is truly a global community. And he was very excited about this music. And I told him, his duty is now to put the theory of Eastern music in connections. Because he was benefiting from the theory of Western music, we need to benefit from this, the uh, theory of Eastern music. Uh, he smiled, promised that he would do it, but, but he didn't. Another example, uh, was that Sunil or Sunil uh, Singh, a uh, engineer in Delhi, his son was having some uh, trouble in physics, high school physics, and so he started writing notes for his son and decided to put them in connections. Now, there are hundreds of thousands of uses of his notes. He has some of the most widely used physics notes in the world. This engineer in Delhi is trying to help his son and had this incredible, unexpected consequence. These, uh, what look like children, are actually uh, graduate students at the University of Texas at El Paso. They're bilingual. They speak English and Spanish, and so they have translated a lot of English content into Spanish. The usage jumped up by maybe three or four hundred percent because suddenly all of Latin America had access to pre, uh, books that previously, if they didn't uh, read English, they were shut off from. So there's this huge uh, improvement in usage <clears throat> by this translation process. So right now, with something like, uh, what I said, 40 languages we have uh, translated into in a variety of different uh, alphabets. And so you can imagine this being useful in India where material could be put into the alphabets that you have in this country. Okay, now, uh, other than a text material, if at 3 a.m. in the morning you're trying to understand a laboratory that didn't make sense, 
a laboratory on automatic control that would balance an inverted pendulum. Well, what you would do is fire up your virtual laboratory through connections and run your lab. If it took you 10 minutes, you'd work on it 10 minutes. You'd say, ah, now I understand it. If it took you three hours, you'd do that. And finally, you can go to sleep. But you can do it at your place, at your time, how long you wish. And it's almost as good as an actual lab, and in some cases, even better. So this was an example of the inverted pendulum. Another example that I'm more fond of is a signal processing example. There's something rather abstract about digital filtering. And when you're trying to explain it just in words or equations, it's very difficult. So we have here on the left, on the left, the input signal. We have the filter, the frequency response in the center. And on the right, we have the output. And so, and then at the bottom here, you can adjust the frequency of the input and see what the filter does to the signal. Then you can also, right here, uh, I think our pointer is dying here. At the bottom in the center, we can change types of uh, filters. Oh, once again, the student can work and work until these abstract ideas make sense. Not at the professor's convenience, but at the student's convenience. Now, how, how, uh, how much are these uh, modules, how many of the numbers, how are they growing? Well, they're growing exponentially. Now, I think almost everyone in this room knows that the exponential is the solution to what? A first order differential equation. That's what saying something goes viral says, that there's the basically a first order differential equation. It's like uh, interest on an investment. You put a dollar in, and it has interest, but then the next session, the interest itself draws interest. Or if you have rabbits, you, the parents have ra little rabbits, and then soon those little rabbits are having more little rabbits, and pretty soon the rabbits everywhere, and the number grows exponentially. Well, on the internet, when something goes viral, this information doesn't just get transmitted to a larger and larger group of people. The information produces information, which produces information, and it grows exponentially. So now we have a situation where people write modules. Other people then see that and write modules. The original people are still writing modules, and the number grows exponentially. All right, we, tr we wanted to provide textbooks for primary in the U.S. community colleges and created the uh, organization called OpenStax. Here are some of the textbooks. Physics, Sociology, Biology, two books in Biology and one in Anatomy, Chemistry, Precalculus, Statistics, Psychology, History, and Economics. Those books are completely changing the community college experience in the United States. The cost of a community college book is the same as the cost of a university book. Community college students don't have the money for that. Students at my university generally come from, from affluent families. They can afford it. It's difficult, but they can afford it. In a community college, they literally cannot. So they don't get an education because of the cost of books. We're going to change that. Now, uh, some of the organizations that are involved here, there's a variety, I think, though, that uh, that's less interesting. An example of the physics book, the committee who uh, vetted, who peer-reviewed this book, contained Nobel Prize winners, contained uh, people who are uh, the, uh, advisors to the U.S. president, 
some of the leaders in, in uh, industry, some of the uh, leaders in the academic world, they're extraordinarily high quality books. All right, enough of, uh, of the cheap books. Let's take a look at uh, MOOCs, Massive Open Online Course. Let's look at the cost of higher education. It's not quite as bad as the cost of books. The cost of legal services is worse, but higher education is pretty bad. So the lecture, this what you're, what I'm doing right now in front of your eyes, is to the is to education what the book is to the education. The lecture used to be the primary source of education, and it's become now the primary hindrance to education. So the MOOC was created to solve the access problem. From Stanford University came two organizations, one called Coursera and the other Udacity. Both of those are for-profit companies that are making MOOCs. MIT and Harvard produced a not-for-profit organization called edX. And I've learned that, that uh, I think, uh, I yeah, at, at MIT. But uh, Kenan, uh, you're, you're going to be doing uh, an edX course at, uh, at Bombay? So uh, IIT Bombay is going to be producing uh, three MOOCs through this edX uh, system. At Rice University, we have uh, courses under both Coursera and uh, edX. Very, very interesting project. Now, here's an example. The introductory circuits course at MIT. 150,000 people signed up for this course. Now, think about that a moment. 150,000 people for a very esoteric course from MIT. Uh, you know, that's just kind of astonishing that that would happen. However, of that, only 26,000 worked the first homework assignment. And of those, only 10,000 took the first exam. And then it kind of leveled off, but only 7,000 completed the course. So there's a huge dropout. The introductory course at Rice University, 37 down to 10, down to 4, and finally, only 257 took the final at the end of 14 weeks. Um, here is a, a plot for the course at Rice. At the top, you see the number of people registering continuing to increase. In the last week of the class, there were people registering for the course. You know, students can just astonish me. I, I just cannot imagine why a person would do that, but they did. Uh, but the performance is the lower curves, and they just kept dropping out, standard. Here is the uh, countries that took these courses. Well, they're English language made in the U.S., so the largest user are from uh, the U.S. But the second largest user, India. Third, Russia. Taking these English language courses in Russia. Then Canada, okay, that's not a big surprise. Portugal, Spain, Egypt, UK, Pakistan, Brazil, interesting. Pa uh, Python is a computer programming language. Uh, it was rated as one of the best in all of the world. It was uh, produced at Rice, and it's a short course. So if you'd like for your, if you're teaching a course, you'd like for them to pick up the language Python, just simply say, go take a MOOC. And that solved that problem. So rather than you're stopping and teaching it or the, uh, offering a course from the computer science department or something like that, simply say, go learn it from a MOOC. The same way you used to do, uh, go read a book. You know, you want to learn Unix, uh, go, okay, here's a book, go read it. Now we've got MOOCs, which hopefully are a bit more uh, efficient than just a book, but as a way to learn something in a, in a clean, tight package. Again, the drop-off of the uh, quizzes. Now, as a, as a uh, mathematician, as an engineer, as a scientist, you look at something like that and you say, exponential. 
And as I just got through asking you a few moments ago, what has an exponential as a solution? A differential equation, a first order differential equation. And from that first order differential equation, you can learn the properties of what's going on in the phenomena. And not just look at it as, oh, that's interesting, but try to figure out why it's doing that. Now here's another interesting thing. MOOCs, they're going to, the people who have no education suddenly have access to an education. Let's look at who are taking MOOCs. The majority of people who take MOOCs have a master's degree. I was totally astonished. The second largest group have a bachelor's degree. Those two have essentially two thirds, take two thirds of the MOOCs. And the, the, the people who didn't finish high school, 1% take a MOOC. The, uh, the people with uh, a, a law or a medical degree, 3%. So the vast majority are people, you know, like us. They're people who've had advanced studies. Now that's an interesting, an interesting discovery. I did not expect that. Now the next one is an even more astonishing result. On the left, you see the length of time of these video modules. A three minute one, a six minute, nine minute, 12, 15, 12. How long did the average student watch now see, you can tell that on the internet. See how long a person watched one of the videos. It peaks out at six minutes. And when you have a longer module, they stop watching it even sooner. So, so if you have one that lasts from six to nine, the people pretty much watch all of it. The rest of them, they don't. Now, how long do we normally teach in a course? Think about that. The last half of your course is a total waste uh, the, of your lecture hour. Only the first six minutes did people bother to listen to. Wow. That, uh, that ought to shake up any professor or any student as far as that goes. They kind of say, oh my gosh, I, I paid money for an hour and I only got used six minutes of it. That's uh, pretty wasteful. Uh, the average age, 30 for this one set of, uh, of courses, or 45 or something like that for another set. So they're not the very young, nor the very old. They're kind of in the middle. So uh, MOOCs are an interesting phenomena, and I, I would encourage you to think of a MOOC as an evolution of the textbook. Do not think of it as the evolution of a standard class. If you think of it as the evolution of a textbook, I normally buy a book, I read some of it until I've gotten what I want, and then I put it down. I don't finish the textbook. Very few books do I read, except unless it's a novel. Uh, but any uh, technical book, I sit down and read until I've satisfied my whatever it was uh, I wanted, and then I move on. So the high dropout rate of the MOOCs is not that discouraging. It's not that different from people just looking at a book Eh, not interested. Because I'm going to give you an assignment in a few moments. And one of those assignments is to go take a MOOC. Credentialing is, uh, is in the process of change. And I don't think that's really, uh, that doesn't fit so much what I'm interested in talking about now, so I'll pass that by. I want to spend just this last few minutes and talk about personalized learning. If I were to get this group right here, and let's say that this was a, an algebra course in a community college, and I said, okay, how many of you can factor a polynomial? Half of you raise your hand. Okay, how many of you uh, can plot a, uh, a, a polynomial? And, I ha and each time I look at that, I produce a book for you that suits your background. If you know how to factor a polynomial, I don't bother with it. If you don't, I give, put the polynomials in. Until finally, after a number of questions, I will have a book for you, your background, your expertise, your interests, 
and my goals in the course, totally personalized for you as an individual. Then when you start taking this course as a MOOC and you start entering to multiple choice questions, I start altering what I present to you next. When you buy a book on Amazon, they offer suggestions. The way they do that is using a model and a procedure known as machine learning. By the way, you should learn something about machine learning. And the easiest way to do it, take a Coursera MOOC. Pick up machine learning. And then you can understand how Netflix, Amazon, and most of the advertisers use your responses to create specialized advertising for you. What we're doing is we're taking students and from their work on tests and homework, we create specialized educational material for that student. So we can tailor it down literally to the individual. We claim the best education takes place when there is one tu uh, when there's a tutor talking to an individual student. That's precisely what this is capable of doing. That will create uh, graphs of ideas and knowledge. And uh, from that, we can run experiments and learn more and more how the human being actually learns. So what I've tried to do is talk a little bit about the OER, the Open Educational Resources, to reduce the cost of books and increase their uh, effectiveness. Talk about MOOCs as a uh, means of providing courses, online courses, for, for tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people. And then finally, the personalization of education. Those three things plus the, the uh, credentialing are going to change higher education. The best universities in the world are going to use this to improve what they do already. The worst universities are going to go out of business. There are many universities that are very frightened of this, and they should be. Second-rate uh, universities have no reason to be. We can outdo a second-rate university with a MOOC. We can't out outdo a first-rate university. So those of us that are at first-rate universities, uh, we not only are, are not threatened, we have an opportunity to improve the worldwide education by producing MOOCs as uh, is being done uh, here and at several, uh, at several of the other uh, IITs as well, and is being done all over the world. Thank you. Uh, not too long ago, there was a news item say, stating that uh, the founder of Udacity felt that MOOCs was not the success that he thought it was when it first came up. Yes, it is true that he said that. Uh, and it's, it's rather ironic that the person who f founded Udacity, a, a professor at Stanford University, uh, said that because, in fact, I think it's v much premature to make a comment like that. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of amazed that he made it. Uh, I am convinced that uh, they are good. We're on the right track. It, changes need to be made. We're still learning. But I, uh, I think they're worthwhile. Uh, what I, the uh, assignment that I wanted to give you is that I'd like for all of you to uh, take, take a, uh, why don't you, thank you. Go look into connections and look at some of those modules. And imagine you're writing some modules to go in it. Now, to ask one of you to write a book you know, I might be able to ask a few faculty members that, that have the time and wisdom and whatnot to write a book, but even that's no longer what they should be doing with their time. You should write a few modules. Every person in this room has some knowledge that would be worth making available to other people that would take maybe a week of your time or maybe even just a few days. So go look at connections. Go look at other OER systems. Your second... Uh, uh, assignment is to go to edX or to uh, Coursera, maybe Udacity as well, one of those three. Find a MOOC and take it. 
The world is changing in front of your eyes. Don't miss that. I mean, that, you know, you're alive and something's happening and you can participate in it. So uh, go, if, you, if you're interested in machine learning, go take the machine learning course from uh, Coursera. Uh, you're interested in uh, signals and systems, you're an electrical engineer. Uh, Rich Baranuk has got a, uh, a MOOC on uh, edX on signals and systems. Uh, we've got uh, the MOOCs on all sorts of things. Uh, IIT Bombay is going to be having uh, th three uh, MOOCs coming online somewhere down the road. So do that. Take a MOOC and, that, and, and, and do not stop until you've taken at least five sessions. After five, if you don't like it, stop. But what the data show is that very often the, the people drop out too quickly. After you've taken five, you, you probably know what you're doing. And at that point, you don't want to study anymore, fine. So take five sessions on a MOOC and you'll be happy. It was interesting watching the chart where you said, you know, that the people who are really taking advantage of the MOOCs are people with bachelor's and master's degrees and all that. I think there's an explanation for that because on the one hand you have people, students who are in, like at IIT who are then graduating and going into work, but there's a whole other aspect which is the continuing education because knowledge keeps going and you need that for your work and so on. If I kind of look at my own example, gosh, I've probably done three or four bachelor's degrees in my yeah. life after graduating from IIT. And I have a feeling that that particular continuing education is a huge customer for all of this because otherwise we really don't have any source to pick up the knowledge. Oh. Uh, because for example, I've known for the last 10, 15 years, I've had to deal with medical. And uh, the only way you do that is on the internet, papers, looking at all of these things. So I suspect, you know, this whole area of continuing education may be one of the areas that may take the most advantage of uh, things like MOOCs and all that. Uh, I think you're right, and when you say continuing education, uh, part of that will be for people who are still professionally uh, involved, but part of it will be for older people, and uh, who perhaps are not looking at it from a professional point of view, but as people live longer and longer, uh, you know, r rather than, than, you know, sitting in a nursing home and playing bingo or something, uh, you can sit down and take a, a course in calculus or philosophy or art history or whatever. I think the most of the things that you have seen in that uh, little graph that uh, Nageshwar was talking about was basically bachelors, masters and all of that. But how about in the grade schools? Speak up. How about the grade schools? I think is it too early for the kids or too young to use these? No, I don't no, think so. No, no, the, the, the uh, kids are already they're, they're, it's, it's hard to, to uh, kind of document this, but I, I know friends, and what they do is they take their young children and they will take, uh, take MOOCs. I mean, there will be grade school kids taking college level courses. And just leave them alone. Don't, don't help them or anything. Just let them do it. See what happens. And you, you, you may, some of you may have uh, heard about this, this fellow that is an Indian. Uh, who put a computer in a hole in a wall out in a village. Uh, I thought it was near uh, Hyderabad, but he it was, said it was it Delhi. Was, it was in Delhi. Uh, yeah, and it turned out the kids learned how to do all kinds of things just totally on their own. But they have to have material to get access from. I would like to, uh, Sydney, excellent talk. I would like to continue from uh, the, one of the last points that you made. Um, we expect a lot of uh, topsy turvies. Uh, and uh, uh, brick and mortar is not required. Um, some of the well-known companies of today, like Apple and so on, were not known 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Given all this, what do you expect, if you have to wager a guess, 10 years from now, how do you think the education scene will be? I, don't, I think the, the, the campus and the residential college experience is a, has a, a social and a cultural component that adds to the educational component in a way that, that uh, the, electric, the, the online and, and uh, electronic means cannot satisfy. So they will augment it 
uh, they will not replace it. But there will be some people who simply cannot take, cannot go to a college, either because of their physical uh, location or uh, because of their cultural, uh, uh, cultural reasons. Maybe uh, they are in a culture where women are not, are not allowed to go uh, out to college. They can take a MOOC. I mean, hopefully. Um, so I, I think that will be one thing. But I, I think that uh, Rice University will, uh, will look pretty much like Rice University does, uh, you know, 50 years from now. But pe professors will be using MOOCs. And just like I say, you know, I'd like for my students to learn Python. Take a MOOC. There's just a ton, uh, even uh, uh, machine learning. One of the advanced uh, signal processing courses that I teach I wanted them to learn some machine learning. So I just said, you know, go take Andrew Ng's uh, course in Coursera. So it's, it's, it's like a book. You tell a person to go read a book. Go take a MOOC. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Butters, for that fascinating talk. We have a small memento. Can I invite uh, Malik to hand the memento? To Sydney. He's a memento guy. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.